The name of this, path, this sermon is List of Enemies That Matter. Zip, zero, zilch. Um, if that's on your bucket list, to have it say a sentence with three Zs, words with Z in it, you can just repeat that one. <laughs> How often do you get to do that? Well, this is an account of enemies, of who they are, and how much we should fear them. It's a long list, and some of them are very formidable. As we read through that, it said um, tribulation, or disaster, or person, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Those are um, pretty formidable enemies. And the, there's a second question in that title that matter? And of course, the second question is, there's no one that matters. And it's not because we're so fierce, it's because who we are with. We were just talking about 1971. Well, in 1972, there was a movie made. And um, I was doing a uh, Valentine's thing for our small group many, a number of years ago. And I found a movie for every year that in that group where they were married, and somebody was married in 1972. And the movie I found was Jeremiah Johnson. Well, Jeremiah Johnson was a, uh, it was kind of a strange movie, and it was a true story, but it was more legend than true. He was a real person, and he was, it was played by Robert Redford when he was his handsomest, and it was a great movie. He wanted to become a mountain man, and he did. And in the movie, um, there was a, a battle, and he would, he killed a bunch of Crow Nation natives, and he took their horses and their guns. And they were at another, another group of natives, another tribe, and he just gave the horses and the guns to the chief. Well, that was a big mistake because the chief had to return a gift of the same value or kill him. And, and so he was really happy that the chief decided to return a, a gift. It was his daughter, and they married right there. And so his <coughs> friend who was with him said, look, it doesn't matter. You do whatever you want with her. You sell her or give her away, but we don't refuse. So, it was, I thought this was a beautiful part of the movie. So this poor girl is, is introduced to him and sent away with him. And she fears him, she doesn't know him at all, she doesn't speak his language. And over the course of three or four, five, six months, he is so kind to her that she eventually falls in love with him and they become a family. And He's, the story goes that he picks up a boy, and I won't go into that. And so they've got a little boy who's 10 years old, and he's got a wife. And after a year or so, the army comes, and they say, you need to show us the way across this mountain, because there's a, a, a wagon train that we have to rescue. And he said, well, uh, okay. So off he went, and they came to a crow, this is the native band, a burial ground, a sacred burial ground. He says, we have to go around this. We can't go through this. It'll be another two days to go around. And they said, there's no time. We're going through it. You either lead us or we'll go through it. So he said, it's a bad idea. I'm going to tell you it's a bad idea. So keep your head down, be quiet, and ride through very slowly. So they did. Nothing happened. On his way back, when they got to the burial ground, he saw his wife's jewelry. She had a bee, beads hanging. And so now he was panicked. And he, he, he rode home as fast as he could, and he discovered that his wife and his, his little boy had been killed. And in a rage, he found those who killed his wife, and against all odds, he killed them all. And there was one man who knew he was going to die, and he was kneeling and he was singing his, fun his own funeral song, and in pity he let him go, which turned out to be a bad idea, because now 
that man went back to the tribe, and he was, the whole nation was against him. And every few months, uh, one of those braves, who was the bravest of the brave, would come to kill him. And over the course of a number of years, he defeated all of them. And he became known as, as this very formidable enemy. They, they had bragging rights. We have this Jeremiah Johnson, who is a formidable enemy. And wisely, the chief eventually came to him, saw him out, and they made a peace agreement. And so it was, the war was over. Now, if you ask men of a certain age, they all remembered this movie. It wasn't a movie that women would remember, but the men all remembered it because it was a man's man. He was independent. He was, he was strong. He was kind. He was gentle unless he was pushed. And then you would, you didn't want to be that one that pushed him. Well, you see, they eventually made peace with him. But those enemies that we read about in here, in this, in this chapter, they never make peace with us. Those enemies will never make peace with us. Those ones that Paul listed, distress and famine or nakedness or peril or sword, is never going to make peace. Now, we're not Jeremiah Johnson, and we're not going to defeat those enemies by ourselves. We're going to need someone who will do it for us, who will look after us. You see, that's the point of this text. Our protector, our savior, the one who will look after us. When the rest, the nation, all of those, all of those enemies are against us. Now, I'm going to look at the text. Let's look, the first point will be, who can be against us? Well, who can be against us? It says in verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, as it turns out, lots and lots can be against us. Most everyone, that's who. And the question is not, the call is not, a, 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 is, it isn't a list or a, how many or how, it's a comparison. See, there's lots of these things that are against us, but in comparison to God, there are really none. Now, there's a, there's a word game that somebody played, and now you can do this in your head, and, and I'll say, tall, and you probably think short, hot, you say cold, pretty, ugly, young, old, Good, evil, God, and what happens is you, you're set up and you say Satan, but really there is no, no one, you cannot make any comparison to God. There is no one equally strong who is evil. It's like saying, well you could say creator created, but that's not the same kind of idea as the rest of them. It's like saying Henry Ford Model T. Well, they, they do connect, but Henry Ford created the Model T. You see, everything, everything that is, was created by God. Even the things that, these things that he allows, are allowed by him. Famine. Persecution, distress, they're all, they, ha they have no ability to do anything unless he gives the okay. Now, second is what's coming our way. If you look at verse 32, it says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him give freely give us all things? Now, he's 
going to freely give us all things. But in order to do that, there's a big question. Do you acknowledge that he gave you his son? And that you need him. You see, if you're like Jeremiah Johnson, you're an independent mountain man. You don't need anyone else. You are so strong that you can do it all yourself. And if that's the case, if you don't need Jesus for salvation, if you don't need him, well, why would he freely give you all the rest of these things? You don't need anything from him. You're independent and strong. Now, you're right if you say, well, God gives. And there's such a thing as common grace. We have a beautiful day out there today. Um, we had rain, which makes the flowers grow. These are all common grace. We have air to breathe. We have seasons to enjoy. We have all sorts of things that are gifts. But when you say, to your, well, these are common grace. Well, then it means you have to say, well, if there's common grace, well, what's uncommon? There must be something that's uncommon. We did that whole thing of good and evil. There's, if there's common grace, there's uncommon grace. And that uncommon grace is what Jesus did. He saved us. And he gave us those things freely. The, the thing is, when he, you say, when you're given something freely, it means you didn't earn it. This is grace. And there's a there's two words here that I want to look at. It's grace is the first one. Love is the second one. Grace is not an action word. Love is an action word. If you love someone, you it it you do things. But grace is not an action word. If you remember Abraham, Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. It's like God told him, I'm going to do something, and Abraham says in his heart, I'll buy that. Wow, wonderful. He doesn't, he doesn't doubt, he just says, God said it, therefore it must be true. See, love is another, the opposite. Love says, <clears throat> I appreciate what you've done for me, and I want to do something to show that I love you. Send cards. I want to do something to show you that I love you. You see, grace we didn't earn. There's nothing we did to get grace. It isn't as if we said, well, I believe that's an action. No, it isn't. Now, I want to tell you a story about a king. Do you remember the story about the native chief? who said, wow, that's a nice gift of all these horses and all these guns, but I have to come up with a gift of equal value. Well, there was a king, and he gave wonderful gifts to people he didn't like. And you're thinking to yourself, well, that's nice. But it wasn't nice at all. He understood in the culture that he lived in, they had to give him a gift of equal value. And he gave them a wonderful gift, knowing that there was no possible way that they could return a gift of equal value without selling everything they had. And he basically said, here's a wonderful gift. You're going to be bankrupt tomorrow. You're going to be destitute in order to give me a gift in return. What he was doing was he was destroying these people in a way that it looked like he was still the nice guy. Well, what a contrast to that story in this verse. God will all these freely give to us. Now, God is the one that started that trend of giving good gifts to people who couldn't return it. If you look on Luke 14, it's 12 to 14, it says, and he went, also went on to say, the one who had invited him, 
When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or the rich neighbors. Otherwise, they will also invite you in return, and that will be your pay repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will re be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. God is saying, Jesus is saying, you don't need to be repaid by them. You need to give them something that you know they can't repay, and you don't want a repayment because God is going to give you a repayment. Number three is who would dare? Well, Lot's will. In verse 33 it says, <clears throat> And who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Well, the verse is saying, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Well, the answer is lots and lots of people. If you remember the story of Job, the devil brought a charge against him. The charge he brought, God said, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil says, oh yeah, I considered him. You've given him all this good stuff. He only serves you because of all the good things you've given him. He brought a charge against him. Um, we're going into an election here. And do you know what an advertisement for a political party is? Most of them are charges against the, elect, the other one. They say, Trudeau, still not ready. Um, my, Michael Shear, is Michael Shear? No, it's, um, anyway, there's a charge against him. It's, that's what it is. Um, I was listening to a, a, a video, watched a video. Um, they were taking down the Robert E. Lee statue, and people came to protest. I mean, they, they, they interviewed this woman who traveled all night from her job when she got off at the daycare, traveled all night to say, no, you shouldn't take down this Robert E. Lee statue. Where there were good, and, and President Trump said there are good people on both sides who are protesting that we take it down or we not take it down. Well, the news media changed that up. They brought a charge against him. You see, there was quite a few white supremacists and some Antifa came and they got in a battle and someone was killed. And he, they, the, the news media brought a charge against him. He's saying these people, these white supremacists are good people. He didn't say that at all. You see, there's lots and lots of people who will bring up a, a charge against you. So what's Paul on about? What's he going on about? Well, it says God is the one who justifies. And no one pulls the wool over his eyes. Do you remember Job? Well, God didn't say to, to the devil, Oh, I never thought. Maybe you're right. No, God knew exactly what was going on. As you read through the story, you understand that the devil just walked into a a trap. God set this whole thing up and he allowed the devil to use, to be used. The devil didn't realize. And we have the book of Job because of it. And we have those wonderful passages that, where God is saying to Job, where were you when I created the world? I love those. Well, goes on to say, who is the one who condemns? Well, it seems that they're not really important. There's lots of them, but they're not really important in, in comparison. It's kind of like, do you remember as a child, you were, going to, you were getting in an argument with somebody, and there was going to be a fight, and you, you say, you and whose army? Well, that's the whole point. You and whose army are going to against God. 
You see, they just want to separate us and divide us and conquer us. And then besides all of that, at the end of the verse, it says, and Jesus is interceding for us. You see, sometimes we get it wrong. All these people are attacking us, and we get it wrong, and we, we sin. But Jesus is there interceding for us. Number four is a short list of those who will try and fail. In verse 35 and 36, it says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just it is it as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, the first thing, you look at that, and all of those things are happening to us. The verse, first part, of, who will separate us from the love of God? Well, all those things are going to happen to us. So the first thing you have to do is define what success and failure look, really look like. Those, that list succeeds in doing what they mean to do. And, and that, what they mean to do is inflict a harm on us and in a big way. The question is not whether they harm us or not, because they do. The question is, will they separate us from the love of Jesus? Um, when I was in grade 8, I had a friend. And... I, my parents didn't send money with me to school to buy chips and pop, and we didn't have the money. And my friend went to the vending machine and says, I'm going to buy you a bag of chips. And he put the money in, and the bag of chips came out the bottom, and he handed it to me. And this boy, who was my age, but a hundred pounds heavier than me, and a foot taller than me, took the bag of chips before I even opened it. And he ran down the hall. And what I should have done is ran after him, jumped on his back, choked him till he was unconscious and beat him to death. No, obviously not. But I should have done something because my friend stopped being my friend because I didn't do anything this man who stole my bag of chips also stole the love of my friend. The only friend I had in school, and he stole the love of my friend. But the point is that that friend, even though he was a good guy, was not Jesus. The guy that steals something from you cannot steal the love of Jesus from you. He may steal something, but there's no hammer big enough to drive a wedge between you and Jesus. I, I looked up this song and played it. Um, you'll remember it. Um, Ain't no mountain big enough. And, I, and, and, and it went on. There's no, nothing can separate you from my love. Now obviously it's a, it's a, it's a Motown song and Motown people they have no problem being separated from the love of someone else. But it's a great song. And the truth is that no, it's true for Jesus. Now you get the impression that all of these that we just read will try to separate you from the love of Jesus, but they won't. They'll, be a, they'll fail. I watched a video of somebody put this together. It's a compilation video of dad saves. Now, there's a video. The starting picture is a family is on the, at the fence. And on the other side of the fence is a drop-off into the Grand Canyon. And there's a little boy who's four or so. And he climbs up on the fence. And he's leaning over the fence looking in. And his feet slip off. And he's falling into the Grand Canyon. And his father just went, grabs him. I mean, it was just like a miracle. And the whole five minutes of the video of our dad saves. A little boy who's on a swing and he tips back and his 
father goes like this and he's in his arms. Or he's, he's on the edge of the pool or something and the dad saves him. All the time. They're wonderful. Well, when you read this, the first part of this verse, who will separate us from the love of Jesus, you're thinking, I thought that meant that we wouldn't suffer all from all these things. I thought you'd save me. I thought you'd, at the last second, grab me. But that's not the case. What it means is they're all coming. This is a war that we will win, but it'll be at great cost. And this requires immortal glasses. Regular glasses that just look at what's going on won't do. You, immortal glasses will show you that this, this sufferings of this present age don't follow a Christian into eternity. Number five. They are big guns, but they will all fail. 37 says, For in all things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, that list could be longer. That list could say false accusations and rumors and lies and disappointments and failures of others or choices that we made that turned out wrong or financial losses or age or infirmity or indignities or phone scams or telemarketers or the loss of mental capacity. I was in to visit my dad and we talked and last night and it, it, he's lost mental capacity. But none of those things are going to separate him from the love of God. As you see, this redefines what it means to, to win. And most people get it wrong. There's a, there's a saying. He who dies with the most toys wins. No, that's not the case. That comes under the heading of gain the whole world and lose your soul. And this should make you want to do nothing that will add to that list. That list that says height or depth or any created thing. Because we can do things. Do you remember the story of David? David was amazing king. And he said to Joab, I want you to count all the soldiers in Israel. And he says, no, that's a bad idea. You know, God said not to do that. We will have lots of troops. God will, no, it has to be done. And you know, the end of the story is that 70,000 people died. And the point was, he did something willfully. To add to that list of what will separate us from the love of God. But you know that he never, even that didn't separate him from the love of God. And God said, do this and I will forgive you. Well, this text is both sobering in that it tells you the least of these things. In verse 35 are coming our way. Some of them. Not all of them probably. You may not suffer tribulation, but you'll probably suffer distress. You may suffer some of the other things. And the better you serve God, the likelihood is the list will be bigger. Because um, those who choose to serve God, is, it's like painting a big target on, their, on your back. Before this conscious choice of serving Jesus, the devil hardly noticed us. But you start making waves, and the people and the devil will ultimately start saying things both good and bad about you. 
There was a pastor in India. I was at the leadership summit this weekend. And in 19, sorry, 2014, there was a black pastor that spoke. And this pastor in India heard that. Anyway, he was he was a pastor of a small church. He had a, a, a sickness that he prayed for God to remove, and it hadn't been removed, and the church was failing, and he had all number of problems, and he was ready to give up. And he watched this sermon, and the, the man was calling him to serve God, to be the one that overcame difficulties, and he cried throughout the whole service, and somebody who was sitting beside him held his hand while he cried, and he went back to his church, a different person, and he, he did, committed to, to, to do what he needed to do, whatever he could do, whatever, and a woman came to him, a Muslim woman, and she asked him to pray for her that she would be healed. Well, he hadn't been healed, but he prayed, and she was healed, and she was so grateful she gave him a gift, an envelope with money, and when he opened it up, it had enough money to pay the entire staff for a year, and that removed one of those burdens of what are we going to do, how are we going to pay each this all coming up sunshine and roses for him. And God was being careful to make sure that things worked out for him. And that works sometimes. If you remember, Paul was saying in Acts 18, 8 to 11, it says, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians who had heard were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul, in the night, by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there for a year and six months, teaching the word of the Lord among them. You see, Paul was safe. God made sure that he was safe. And no one attacked him. You see, none of this makes sense except in the light of the cross. How come sometimes we're able to do all this for, for Jesus and there's never, never a problem? And then other times, if you read through the book of Acts, Paul went there and he was beaten and he was stoned and he was imprisoned and it was horrible. So why? Why is it one way sometimes and another way others? The rational thought would be, I'm serving God faithfully. He will have my back. He'll keep me from being in harm. He'll keep me. I'll be safe in the arms of Jesus. And it was true in the case of Paul in Corinthians, in the church in Corinth, and it was true for this man from India for that period of time. But in other places, it's not true. What we have to say is, I trust God to shield me from harm, or allow me to take the full force of all the evil that can come from the hundred miles around. In either case, it's within his plan, and it's my reasonable service to say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, this takes this text makes it clear that all of these enemies will succeed, but only for a day against us, and in the end we'll be victorious with our Savior. God wants us to count the cost. He wants us to understand that these things will come. But also, at the same time, 
when you count the cost, he wants you to count the cost of what will happen if you say, well, if God's not going to protect me, I'm not going to serve him. What will be the cost of that too? He wants us to see that the love of God is far better than all the things that can happen to us. And we can never lose it. 